Don't laugh for that. Don't laugh dancing. Been out dancing all night. Been down the old disco tech. Do 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 do. Denzel, I went down there. Uh, load of my mates. So Brad Pitt was there. He's a skinny little runt, isn't he? He was there, and uh, Linda Evangelista, she turned up. George Clooney, right? Uh, I didn't like him, far too smart of looking. Looks like George Hamilton IV. And, uh, oh, no, no, a terrible time. This bird turned up, uh, Cameron Diaz, right? Cameron Diaz, and I've had a few beers, and I've said, here, come here, baby. Where I live, that's a bloke's name. <laughs> and she blew me out, but I said, off at my Anyway, uh, now then, look at that. What, what do you think? What do you think the old microwave? Look this. 19 whatever the ones on the top are. <laughs> and 48 bottom ones. That's an interesting fact, isn't it? That's 19 inches wide, that microwave. And that's a permanent measurement. That'll never change. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm interested in things like that. Um, oh, a fantastic thing I've discovered. Uh, look, look at this. A uh, thing of beauty, whatever, right, look. Now that, on its own, quite dull, right? But look at this. Hey? Now I've entered a whole new league, haven't I? You think, ah, but listen, you're thinking, can't get any classier than that, Millsy. Oh, no. Now look at that. <laughs> now you just tell me whether Claudia Schiff is not going to be impressed by that. Fantastic. But the most amazing thing is this, right? You get it. You get a music box, plays the lovely, I don't know, some ballet, nutcracker sweet piece of music, look. Stick it in the old microwave there. Two, one, 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 two, two, one, 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 two, one, and then I think eight, six, four, don't really matter. Press start, <laughs> give it a minute. Ding! Packet of tunes, you can't beat that, can you? <laughs> Fantastic invention, that is. Now, oh, now that cupboard... Now that's interesting because you'd think the cupboard doors would be the same width. Now they're obviously wider than the microwave. 32 and a half inches. And that's a permanent measurement that'll never alter. <laughs> Fantastic, guys. What have we got in here? Oh, here yeah, are, look. Have you ever been somewhere, right? Have you ever been, uh, have you ever been somewhere and there's some poor unfortunate people, right, who haven't got as much money as you? Because you know, hey, how much money have I got? Look at that. <laughs> Bloody wench! <laughs> and, um, but sometimes you meet people and they haven't got as much money as you, but they just go like, um, I'll give you some money. And you look at them, you think, you don't look like a beggar, right? So what I've done is I've marketed these things, and these are special costumes that beggars can wear. Uh, maybe if they support Man United, they wear red and white beggars' uniforms. If they support Blackburn Rovers, they support blue and white quartered beggars' uniforms. And I've marked them, there they are, look, you can see them there. Begging strips. There you go. <laughs> Put them on to begging. There you go. Uh, oh, we are. Welsh people come around my house, right? Cup of tea? Mm hmm. Do you like milk with it? And I go, oh, yeah. There's a big treat because they don't get milk in the valleys, right? And I'll give them, they go, oh, this is lovely. But what they don't know, look, I've given them that. Look. Cat milk. <laughs> <laughs> but what amazes me is how do you milk a cat? <laughs> you'd be there for hours, you'd have to have a little bucket like a thimble like that, for a tiny little stool to milk a cat with. And uh, this is the other thing I'll give them, right? Because I, I, I like to play jokes on them. And I go, would you like a sandwich? Mmm, oh yeah, they go, lovely. And they eat it and they think, oh, what's this? Oh, beautiful. Oh, is it beef? Mmm, is it pork? Is it veal? No, look what I've given them, look. Hamster sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't know. It's still a treat for them. The only Welsh people have to... Oh, look what he's done. I, I don't mind him coming round here. Prince Nassim, right? Hamed. I don't mind him coming around spying, but he's left his bloody boxing gloves again. <laughs> right, and he'll need them. He'll, no, he'll need them if he's got another big championship fight coming up. Right? Uh, oh, is, have you seen me new part that I'm taking in the new uh, series when it comes out? There I am. See, there I am there, look. <laughs> I want to be the new gladiator. They've got me in, right, they've got me in the team because they said uh, one of them has just become so muscle-bound and so horrific looking that it's absolutely ugh. So they've said, sorry, uh, Ulrika, you're going to have to go. <laughs> anyway, you're going to stay around for a while. I've got some stuff to show you. Uh, you're lucky to find me in, obviously, because normally this time of night I'll be out and about. It's amazing. I've just been in that shop and it turns out I've got a brother I never ever knew about, right? And I've got this rich uncle, I had no idea he even existed, and he's died 
and left me a load of money, right? But um, even more amazing than that, I've been in there and the bloke who owns that shop has just told me, right, that my old woman, my wife, right, she's bigamist, she's been married to another bloke before, right? And what about this? He just told me this as well, which is fantastic, right? Is that, you know the capital of France, right? It ain't Paris. It's an amazing shop. <laughs> but uh, there's something else I want to show you, right? And this is a lot of these things I show you, and they uh, kind of make fun of them. But not this, because this is uh, it's my uncle, bless him. It's my uncle James Alexander, and he's a wonderful man, and he's got a hobby, uh, which in this world, in this modern, uh, everything get quick, oh fast speed, flashing lights, oh Ninja Turtle, Sanyo, oh that, no, it's gone out of fashion. But I think it's something that young people should take more of an interest in it. Uh, and this is this is what he does, right? He measures things. Now I've got to read the dry thermometer first. And that one says 15.0 centigrade. Now the next one I go to is the thermometer on the grass. Surprising difference between concrete and grass, isn't it? Surprising. <laughs> uh, he knows that, and you don't, because you've wasted your life thrill seeking. <laughs> grass, I took the temperature, the minimum there was 1.7 centigrade, mm. and on this concrete, it's 6.6 .6 centigrade. Oh, I'm absolutely fascinated. <laughs> uh, what, what's, now, what's this here? It gets even better. No, there's no rain that. That's empty, there's no rain in there. I so quite like to writing down. figures down. Um, I've, I've measured the height of the railway viaduct. I've measured the height of the railway viaduct. No, you haven't. <laughs> That's impossible, you couldn't have done that. You're just saying that to appear big and trendy in front of some of the girls, aren't you? Because there's all trains running past there, isn't there? You'd get killed by the trains. That was a tricky job, because you had to wait till there's no trains running, and on Christmas Day there's no trains running, so... I walk along the side of the railway line. <laughs> <laughs> How foolish of me for not realising that. Christmas Day, when the rest of the country are at home with their loved ones enjoying some seasonal goodwill. That's the time you want to be measuring the height of the railway viaduct. <laughs> and I got my tape measure, 100 feet long, and dropped it down to the ground, and I got a girl to come out with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What kind of a date was that? <laughs> if you're on your own for Christmas, come and spend it with me. I'm going to measure the viaduct. Stand at the bottom and I'll chuck a tape measure down. She was at the bottom to tell me that it was on the ground. I didn't tell my wife because I got in the row if I'd told her. I didn't tell my wife. Why not? Darling, uh, won't be having Christmas dinner with the family this year. <laughs> Popping out down the railway viaduct with a young lady friend of mine to do a spot of measuring. <laughs> and that was 72 feet from the top to the bottom, so I knew what that was. That was quite, you know, a very good fact that was. That's a permanent figure. It won't move. Permanent, is that? will never move. <laughs> Because I'll tell you one thing about uh, railway viaducts, them solid things, once they've decided what height they are, that's it. Very little changing of minds in the railway viaduct height industry, I'll tell you that. Also, when they were repairing the railway line on a weekend, uh, they had the railway closed and all the current was turned off. And they're working in the tunnel, and I walked from one end of the tunnel through to the other. I'd always an ambition to do that, because you can see from one end to the other, but when you're in it, it's that dark. And I counted all the sleepers through the tunnel, I measured the distance of them, and multiplied it out, and it's half a mile long, that tunnel. And that was built in 1862, the same date as the viaduct the was. <laughs> built in 1862, same date as the viaduct. That's probably why then there was never a period when the trains just came out the tunnel and collapsed into the... <laughs> 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 That's anyway, that's my uncle James Alexander. Quite possibly the most interesting man in the history of the entire world. Uh, but here's, um... Oh, man, that's interesting, look. Because that's exactly the same width as that one. <laughs> so that they both fit into the hole. Isn't that fantastic? And that'll never change, that's... <laughs> here's another programme that I made, right, and this one. Uh, prepare yourself now for something a tad more sinister. 
This is an absolutely true life thing that I went out and I filmed with the family. Great danger to myself, I have to say. And uh, it's a harrowing tale. Just, just watch it. That's my son, Sean, his incubator. I knew what Sean was going to do to his family. I'd have smothered a little bastard. <laughs> Harsh words. <laughs> Harsh words. Let, let's, let's meet Sean anyway and, and get his side of it. I'd smother the bastard now. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, let's, let's see what's going on. I found out there was a contract out on me when my best friend, Terry, stopped me outside the Dutchie pub and said, I'm just warning you now, so you know, your dad's put ten grand up on your head and uh, there's people queuing up to take it. His dad had put a £10,000 contract out on him. He's going to have his own. He said, if you kill my son, I'll pay you 10 grand. Why? What the hell's going on in this family? My friends came in here, into my home, and said that Sean was a police informer, which I didn't believe. You know, I couldn't believe it. And I asked them, I just said, hey, you know, I said, uh, you shouldn't even say that, even in a joke. And they said, this is in front of his mother. And all they said, we're not joking. You know, your son is a police informer. It just, it, it just tore everything out of me. In fact, it, it made me that mad. This was me wedding ring. I'm sorry, I'm welling up a little bit now because I, I know what's happened. This is his wedding ring, just let me tell you. And he told Sean, he loved his son, so he told him that he could have that wedding, room, <laughs> wedding ring when he was dead and bred. Now, Sean, I said to Sean, like, he could have that, you know, when I was dead and bloody, he could take that. His name was in that, his date of birth. Uh, took it off, you know, sawed it off my finger, put it in a vice and squashed it. You know, threw it and his, his mother went and got it, you know. That's the ring, by the way, not the finger. <laughs> in case you're thinking he's a psychopath. <laughs> Hold on. That's a coming for some rather... That's been in a vice, hasn't it? <laughs> Be honest, the first time you missed the ring, didn't you? Oh! <laughs> no, it's a very harrowing tale of uh, son as police informer. Off the street. I brought it back. She only gave me that yesterday. I didn't know she still had it. Plus, I wanted to rip all the photographs up, you know. Everything that had anything to do with him, I wanted to destroy. And I wanted nothing to do with him, but women are different. They see things different. After all, she carried him. For nine months, you know what I mean? That she's his mother. And she was upset. She said, No, no, don't, don't destroy the photographs. I said, Well, look. I said, I don't want anything of him there. So he's now on the horns of a dilemma. He's discovered that his son is, is a police informer, right? He wants to destroy everything. But his wife is saying, No, don't destroy all the photographs. He's on the horns of a dilemma. How is he going to compromise? And he does reach, I think, a fantastic compromise between keeping the pictures of his son and at the same time letting the world know what his son has done. I said, I'm going to put his, his a fucking grass on there on his photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> Fucking grass. <laughs> but here's the amazing thing. This is the absolutely amazing thing. Two things, right? Firstly, that only matters because you live in Manchester, right? That only matters because if you live in London, you inform on your friends you're a grass. Uh, we've discovered you're a grass and we've all got together and we're not going to talk to you anymore because you're a grass. Chaps are grass. Absolute shower. But in Manchester, you're a fucking grass. <laughs> You've got to die. But the great thing is, after this programme, I was there. Police came in, uh, are you Miss Keating? Yes, I am. What do you want, copper? You're under arrest. What for? Well, because you've just said on television that you've put a £10,000 uh, target on yourself. <laughs> That's incitement to kill. <laughs> Who informed on me? <laughs> well, you did. 
Oh, I'm a fucking grass! It's ten grand, you've got to kill me! I'm a fucking grass! <laughs> Listen, after the break, I'll prove to you that grown men can fly. I'll see you in a minute. Chat and date. Call friends heart to heart. 0891 97 97 97. Is in your hands. Vote all the paso. Join the party. than our tactical discussion. Not going anywhere for a while? Grab a Snickers. I bet Fergie never has this trouble. Jersey where spring comes earlier and we grow the most delicious new potatoes with a flavour all their own. Jersey Royals, the flavour of the month. I love you, Joyce. Uh, thanks, Jack. Oh, for a roll, Derek. Warburton's also bakers of rolls and babs. The brand new Ripsaw at Alton Towers. Can you cut it? Uh, this is a problem here that we've got. Now, look at this. Imagine I'm just a normal pedestrian. Now, I'm walking along. Now, I come across this sign. Have a look at this sign. Now, <laughs> I take the first alternative. That's no problem. I go that way. I'm there. I look very carefully. And I'm off down the road. All right. But what about the slightly more stupid person? I don't know. Maybe a pensioner or a Welsh pedestrian. <laughs> sees the sign and takes the other option. Comes up, sees the sign, and... Bang! There, you see? Now imagine the trauma there to the, ke the, the skull area, the face, the nose would be broken, and all because of what looks like a perfectly innocent sign, but in fact, it's a death trap. It's a death trap. Death trap. <laughs> Super. Uh, welcome, welcome to my little Hollywood corner. You find me ad uh, admiring this. This was presented to me uh, by British Airways, because I was their one millionth passenger. So uh, they gave me that. It was, uh, it was just a normal flight from uh, London to Edinburgh, actually. Uh, it's, this is 747, but Liam and Noel Gallagher were around, and Liam smacked Noel over the end of it, and he's bent all the nose down like that. <laughs> like, 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 they were around, and in fact, Liam and Noel, bless their hearts, they brought me a little gift, uh, because, well, they're very big on marketing, the, the Gallagher brothers, 
Uh, they've got the records, obviously, which you may be aware of, I don't know. They've got t-shirts, they've got caps, and they've come out with something now I think it's going to be a real big money spinner. Look at that. Their very own toilet paper, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Hey, wipe your ass the Wonder Wall way. That's what they say. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, I've got something, uh, I've got to show you now, another one of them films that I made, uh, something else I was involved with. Uh, do you know where Mentmore is? Mentmore? You don't know, do you? It's, uh, it's an old historic house, and it used to be... Uh, the, the country seat of the Prime Ministers of this uh, wonderful country of ours, if I can call it that. Uh, these days, though, at the time I made this film, there was a far more important organisation there. Mentmore was once the home of a British Prime Minister, Lord Rosebery. Today, it's the home of the British Ministers of the World Government of the Age of Enlightenment. The World Government of the Age... That's got to be the most powerful organisation in the world! That's a fantastic group of men. <coughs> The chief minister, Stephen Benson, sits down to lunch with his fellow ministers. He's the governor, right? He sits down with his fellow ministers. So, he'll have a minister of agriculture, minister of fisheries and food, minister of defence, minister of state for the home office, minister of health, all that kind of thing. They include the minister of health and immortality. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's just one weirdo. They don't mean there's going to be any more. And the minister of all possibilities. Hello. <laughs> We're off on a wacky one, gang. <laughs> Minister of all possibilities. And the other thing is, they are all men. I mean, surely even even the most the most right wing conservative died in the wall cabinet would have some women in it. What, what's the problem with this lot? All the ministers are men. Senior women in the movement live separately in Kent. What kind of group is that to join? And the rules are, yes, you can join, lovely to have you, two pound a week subscriptions, and you have to go and live on your own in Kent. And one of the things they do is they, they encourage the, the cities, so it turns on dental meditation, but they're cities, and cities are a whole different ballgame when it comes to doing weird and wacky and wonderful things. Many people see the introduction of the cities as a turning point for TM. Meditators who took up the cities switched from a simple relaxation technique to deep meditation sessions lasting several hours. This is where the cities are practised at Mentmore. It's called the Flying Room. Right, this is something I used to do. I, I can do that. All Western, Eastern, Oriental arts, I can do it. And, in fact, I think I might be in that room. I can't tell there's so many people in there. I can't even see if I'm there. But you see all that, that, that bloke there in the blue? You see him? You see him? Can you see him? Oh, uh, maybe it's different for you because you ain't a proper city like me. The cities, it's said, can not only make you invisible and give you the ability to see <laughs> hidden objects and to foretell the future, most sensationally of all, one of the cities enables you to fly. This claim has astounded independent researchers who previously had a sympathetic approach to TM. Peter Pierce was a senior TM teacher for many years and Marcus Dawes was a pupil. Marcus Dawes is hugely comfortable in his role, isn't he? Very happy to be there. Pierce describes how he ran a flying session as right. a TM teacher. Here's the flying. Right. Now we will start the cities after meditating for 20 minutes. Of course. So then they would go through their process of, of repeating the, the, the cities. Then I'd say, right now the flying. And then I would do... And now he's going to do the flying. You may never have seen a man fly before because this program wasn't aired quite as widely as it should have been, all right? because various organisations tried to hush it up, but you're now about to see a man actually flying. Just prepare yourself, one of the most marvellous things you've ever seen. Technique! There we go! So, <laughs> <laughs> formation flying now, it's like the Red Arrow's aerobatic team. There we go! <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then mugs of British Airways wasted all that money on Concord! <laughs> just do it yourself! What is difficult for outsiders to understand is why Siddhas, those who practice the Siddhi technique, like the ministers of the world government, continue to believe in it, even when they consistently fail to stay in the air. No, what people find hard to understand is how six generations of inbreeding and they've still all got five fingers on the same hand. We set up the exact experiment which had been done Brain in the doctor. States, and we found uh, that 
the results that they reported were correct. There is no doubt there is a fall in metabolic rate. All right, so we're left to... Right, fall in metabolic rate, which means that in fact you're a little bit stoned and maybe you imagine that you're flying, all right? So they set up this experiment to get someone incredibly relaxed to see if the same thing works in laboratory conditions. Thank you, Tom. You okay? Mm -hmm. We're playing some Vangelis music through here. Oh, do you know, I think I might take this little kit home with me for those terrible nights when I can't sleep. <laughs> So that's it. You can, you can truthfully say that you've seen people flying. And don't think, oh, there's a trick involved. In fact, I hadn't realised, I'd thought for all these years, that my kids were just little bastards. Look at you. You're ruining your bed. But they're not. They're actually flying. <laughs> Bless their little hearts. I've got to go anyway, because I've got a lot of interesting things to do. So, uh, got to fly. See ya. <laughs> out what he were doing I just uh, I was just disgusted I wanted to destroy everything uh, everything in the house about him but his mother she said no don't don't destroy everything <coughs> but they say things different don't they she is his mother she carried him and she said no don't destroy everything don't destroy all his pictures but I said right if you want his picture on that wall I want fucking everyone to know exactly what he is. <laughs>